a world leader in the research and development of innovative medical devices, the Bionics Institute was founded by Bionic Ear pioneer, Professor Graham Clark. Professor Clark led the University of Melbourne team that created Australia's cochlear implant to change the lives of people with hearing impairment. In 1978, Rod Saunders was the first person to receive this implant. When did you become deaf? Where do I live? I knew the cochlear implant operation on Rod was a success when we developed a speech code for electrical stimulation of his brain that enabled him to recognize some words without any help from lip reading. Can you hear me now? Is it loud enough? In the end. In the end. I was so overcome with emotion, I went quietly into the next door lab and burst into tears of joy. The Institute opened its doors in 1986 and undertook research to improve the cochlear implant. Commercialised by Cochlear Limited, the implant has given hearing to more than 600,000 people around the world. The creation of the Bionic Ear Institute allowed me to coordinate my professorial duties as the head of a university department with that of a research institute. Our coordinated research made significant progress and the Bionics Institute has continued as an excellent participant in Melbourne's overall research effort. At that time, bioengineering was in its infancy with a divide between physiologists and engineers, but much has changed in the field. There is now a meeting of minds in engineering and medical biology. Engineers now have a good understanding of medical biological problems and vice versa. The fertile ground for innovation in bioengineering fostered by Professor Clark at the Bionics Institute has led to a new approach to Parkinson's disease deep brain stimulation treatment, the design of electrodes in the Australian bionic eye, development of the EpiMinder epilepsy monitoring device, and a vagus nerve device which shows promise in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, and type 2 diabetes. Our deep expertise in hearing research at the Bionics Institute has given rise to a revolutionary new test for infant hearing, a test for tinnitus that lays the groundwork for new treatments, research into the genetic modification of nerve cells to respond to both light and electricity, and the development of therapeutics to use nanotechnology to restore age-related hearing loss. We are honoured to continue Professor Clark's legacy of innovation in the creation of medical devices to treat challenging medical conditions. And we welcome you to join us on the journey. Welcome everybody. I'm delighted to have you all here with us this evening to the inaugural Bionics Institute 2022 Innovation Lecture. We thank you all for joining us to hear how Australian innovation can build our country and impact on human health and well-being throughout the world, picking up on the legacy of people like Graham Clark. Let me begin by acknowledging the people of the Kulin Nation as traditional custodians of the Nam lands we meet on today. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and future. Before we jump into this, a few housekeeping items. I won't ask you to switch your phones off, but I would ask you to keep them on silent mode. You will need them if you want to ask questions via Slido, which we'll use for questions following the keynotes panel and the panel speakers. There is a QR code on the programs that you got when you came in which will link to the app. You can use Slido to either ask questions or upvote a question during the event. Please make sure that you name the panellists that you'd like your question to be directed to. We invite you to join us for drinks and canopies after the event, where you'll be able to meet tonight's presenters and panellists, 
as well as some of our researchers from Bionics Institute and our sponsors in the MedTech showcase outside. So why are we here at the Innovation Lecture? Australia is known as a nation of inventors. As you saw, the cochlear implant developed at the University of Melbourne and the Bionics Institute over 40 years ago, the CPAP technology developed by ResMed, and the HPV vaccine developed by Ian Fraser in CSL are very well-known examples of Australian innovation which has been successfully translated. These life-changing inventions have been a significant contributor to Australia's economy, providing jobs and wealth. However, these successes hide the fact that Australia's performance in translating our innovation is suboptimal. The most recent report from the Global Innovation Index ranked Australia 25th out of 173 countries for innovation, but only 78th for knowledge diffusion, a proxy for translation. This is despite Australia being ranked number one country in the world for years of schooling. As world leader in the development of medical devices, the Bionics Institute is passionate about and dedicated to improving the translation of Australian innovation. Our hope in creating this event is that by bringing together leaders in the medtech, biotech and life science ecosystem to share their journeys and insights with the broader community, it will provide inspiration for other innovators, entrepreneurs and backers to follow. We are extremely proud that the event has been supported by some magnificent sponsors who have a focus on innovation. We'd like to thank our major sponsor, NAB Health. We're delighted to welcome the NAB team here tonight and look forward to a long and mutually beneficial relationship for many innovation lectures and initiatives to come. We are also extremely proud that two of our major sponsors of this event, Neobionica and DBS Technologies, are successful spin-out companies from Bionics Institute. Tonight you'll be hearing from two keynote speakers from two ends of the Australian, the, from the Australian uh, startup and, and ecosystem. I'm honoured to welcome uh, Dr Andrew Nash, Chief Scientific Officer of CSL and Honorary Associate Professor at the University of Melbourne. Andrew has had a hugely impressive career spanning a PhD in immunology, groundbreaking veterinary research, research head and subsequently CEO of ASX company Amrad, renamed Zenith, and for the past 16 years, a stellar research career at CSL. As Chief Scientific Officer of CSL, he is leading a global effort to develop new medicines to treat serious disease. I know Andrew fairly well, we work together. He has lived and breathed the innovation translation journey at startup, early stage, and major company level. Tonight, Andrew will outline some of his personal journey and learnings, his thoughts and experiences on how we might bridge the valley of death between research and commercialization, and some of the major initiatives that CSL is making in this regard. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Dr. Andrew Nash. Look, uh, thanks very much, Rob. Um, it's a fantastic uh, opportunity to be here tonight to talk to this audience about innovation. Um, from my perspective, it's innovation in the medical research se sector. Um, it's been a, a, a long uh, journey for me from the times that I worked with Rob um, at, to where I'm at now at CSL, but it's been a very rewarding journey, and I think um, it's, a, it's a, a career that really allows you to feel that you're making a contribution to the health and, and uh, well-being of Australians. But firstly, before I start, I too would like to acknowledge uh, that we're on the lands of the Wurundjeri people, who are the traditional owners, and acknowledge their elders past and present, and also acknowledge any other Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders that are here from other communities. So, uh, look, in putting together this talk uh, for this evening, I, I was really thinking about... Um, you know, the issues that as scientists and as um, 
employees, within universities, within medical research institutes or, or indeed companies, the issues and challenges we have when we want to translate research. And, and I guess we would all agree that there has been an increasing focus on translation over the last few years. I think it's interesting to note some of the, the change in language that's occurred across that period of time. So when we talk about translating research, I suspect everybody here thinks about patients. When we talk about commercialising research, I suspect people start thinking about investors and pharmaceutical companies. And I think, it's, although it's a false dichotomy, it's something that's led to a bit of a divide between the academic sector on one side and the commercial industry sector on, on the other side. And I, I, I would say there's been a huge effort over the last few years to really bridge that gap, and uh, I think there's some room to go, um, but we're making some great strides. So CSL, as you know, I think, is, uh, as all of you will know, has been uh, operating in Australia for over 100 years now. Um, our R&D is a global organisation now, as I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. Um, but our research, our early, early stage research, is based here in Melbourne. Uh, we, we think Melbourne's a fantastic location to undertake early stage research and, and to translate that research. So we have a real vested interest in the ecosystem. For us, we, we see uh, a, a thriving, um, you know, really substantial small company innovation sector as really critical to the success of CSL. So when we think about investing in the sector where we can help, you know, it's not only um, that we want to see companies grow and develop, it's that we understand that that's critical to our success as well. Hmm. There we go. So in terms of what I'm going to talk about today, I will, as Rob said, give you um, a, a brief background to my research and translation career and, and an introduction to CSL R&D, and that's more to give you some um, context to some of the comments I'm going to make later about where I see the opportunities for improving um, translation. I'm then going on, on to talk about challenges and opportunities in the translation space and to talk about some of the things that CSL and our partners are undertaking in order to really facilitate um, that, that translation. I was looking at this icon, and just this icon will come up later, and just in case anyone is wondering, th that figure down the bottom is a patient. I'm not sure, but that's, that's translation from science to patient. So when you see that coming up, that's what I'm talking about. Now, in, in terms of, you know, the areas of the, uh, you know, the drug development, research and drug development that I've been in, it, it's summarised briefly here, and I guess to start at the end, the one, one thing that I've certainly learnt from all of this is that having more money is certainly better than having less. <laughs> and, and the reason for that is not because if you have a lot of money, you have a lot of good ideas, because I've seen a lot of people spend a lot of money on really stupid ideas over many years. Um, but what the, what the finance and the support allows you to do is to really go out and look for those novel ideas and when you find them, it gives you the resources to translate them. It's ex we know it's expensive to take a drug from, you know, research bench through clinical trials um, and, and resources and access to resources are really important. So in, in my career, I've gone from a, an academic in a research lab where if you managed to get a grant for a few hundred thousand dollars, you were down the street buying the bottle of champagne, through to where I moved to the biotech sector in, in 1996, and, and that was a, a timely move. I think there was a, you know, the first phase of growth in the sector here, you know, the first real golden age for biotech probably was from the early 90s through to the mid-2000s, and I was lucky enough to, to join AMRAD, and I see John Grace is here tonight too, as one of the first CEOs there. Um, and that was a real opportunity for me to see how the sector worked. Um, I'll comment a little bit later on, on some of, some of the, the things that we did right at that time, but some of the things that probably weren't working that well as well. And, and then, you know, in, in that environment, you know, we were spending around, you know, 10 to $15 million a year on research, and we were a cash-burning company, you know, going through about $5 million a year. We did have some revenues, but even that seemed like a lot of money at that time. And, and then moving on to Zenith and the, the acquisition of, of Zenith by CSL, when I arrived at CSL in, in 2006, 2007, we were spending about $161 million a year on, on R&D, and the market cap of the company was about $5 billion. And so if you fast forward 15 years, 
You know, last year, financial year 2021, we spent $1.2 billion on, on R&D and the revenue of the company was around $10.6 billion. So I, I say that not because, you know, I'm overwhelmed with the success of CSL, but because the growth of CSL has allowed people like me to really pursue our passion of translating research and making sure that innovations in Australia and elsewhere have that opportunity to find their way through to patients. Shareholders are important. We talk a lot about our shareholders at CSL, but I can guarantee you we talk a lot more about patients than we talk about shareholders. So th this is what CSL R&D looks like at the moment. Um, th there's five therapeutic areas we work in uh, plus vaccines. The idea of a therapeutic area focus is relatively new to CSL, a big, really a big strategic shift for us. For most of our life, we were a platform focused company. We had plasma, what drugs could we develop out of plasma? Um, in 2016, 2017, as the company was growing, we took the opportunity to become much more focused uh, and started developing skills and, and capability in the therapeutic areas that you can see here. Obviously, some of these we've been, you know, involved with for many, many years. So immunology, haematology, areas that CSL had always been strong with in, and of course, we've made influenza vaccines and other vaccines for a very long time as well. But areas like respiratory disease, transplant and cardiovascular are relatively new for us. Um, we've always had a plasma fractionation platform. That's what really holds the company together. I suspect, though, if you ask most people on the street, you know, what does CSL make, they would tell you they make flu vaccines and they wouldn't know much more. Flu vaccines are a very important part of what we do, but they only represent sort of 20% of, of our revenue overall. Most of our revenue comes from plasma, products coming from plasma fractionation and recombinant DNA technology. Uh, and more recently, we've invested in developing a cell and gene ther therapy capability. And when you put all that together with, with our, our commercial team, um, you know, we get the revenues we do and, and on average we put sort of 10 to 11% of revenue back into R&D, which gives us about $1.2 billion to spend. That's not high globally, but it's, uh, you know, a significant uh, amount in the context of Australian R&D. That gives us about 2,500 or so R&D staff at covering, you know, the very early stages of research, which I lead all the way through product development, clinical development, regulatory affairs, and the whole variety of people that support that process. Now, that's, that's you know, at a high level what CSL looks like in terms of R&D, but I thought you might be interested, before we start talking about the system, um, in, in looking at some of the, or one of the new products that CSL has been um, working on, and indeed a product that's just recently finished its phase three, give you a sense for the type of research we're doing and, and the patient focus that we have. So this, this patient here suffers um, from hereditary angioedema. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a genetic condition, affects sort of one in 10,000 to one in 50,000 people. And it's a pretty horrible condition. You can have spontaneous vascular leakage in a variety of locations. This person is having a, a cutaneous attack. If you have one of these attacks in, in the larynx or in the surrounding area, they can be fatal. Um, it's due to upregulated uh, protein cascade leading to bradykinin production. Um, you can see uh, the, the pathway down here on, on the, the bottom right of the slide. The underlying mutation is in, a C, is in C1 inhibitor um, and ultimately without C1 inhibitor you get uncontrolled uh, progression of that pathway through to bradykinin which causes the swelling that you can see here. The attacks are unpredictable. People can tell there's a sort of a pro, pro syndrome where they can tell those attacks are coming, but you know, really uh, there's been little to do about it except sort of on-demand treatment with replacement therapies targeting um, uh, in replacement of the C1 inhibitor, and in fact a therapy that was developed by CSL. When we looked at this, these patients weren't treated well. It was intravascular infusion. Um, they weren't treated prophylactically. They were treated when they were having an attack and often it was too late. So we decided to try and look for uh, new ways to treat these patients. Most of this work was done here in Melbourne, but with collaborations in various locations around the world. This is just some of the preclinical data that the scientists in the room will recognise this sort of work. Um, it's, it, it, they're, they're animal models of different diseases and we're looking at the efficacy of our clinical development candidate. So you, on, the, on the left hand side there, you can see really what is a model of vascular leakage or hereditary angioedema. The, the mouse is filled up with blue dye, you induce vascular leakage, the blue dye moves out into the ear, and if you treat that mouse with 3F7, which is a, a, um, 
a, a similar antibody, if not identical, to garadasumab, you can block that, that swelling. We also know that um, factor 12, the target for garadasumab, is involved in the contact-activated pathway of coagulation. And that's what causes your blood to coagulate when it, for example, hits an oxygenator in an ECMO system or a filter in a bypass system. And patients get loaded up with heparin to stop that coagulation, and that causes bleeding problems. What we're able to show is that if we treat patients with this, this antibody, we block factor, factor 12 activity, we can prevent coagulation from forming on the fibres of the oxygenator, as you can see there, in, in the same way that you get, or in, to the same efficacy as you get with heparin. The big advantage was if patients that are on heparin um, you know, have any sort of disruption, physical disruption, they can bleed profusely, and it's a terrible outcome. With this antibody, you can prevent the thrombosis, but you don't get a bleeding effect. So that's a really interesting opportunity as well. But what we've been doing, we've been pursuing the hereditary angioedema, and, and this is the result of all of that work. This is a phase two study that we did over sort of 2021, 2022, published this year in Lancet, where you can see uh, that patients went from having four to five attacks of hereditary angioedema per year, per, sorry, per month, to essentially having no attacks. So this was a, you know, this was a life-changing therapy for this small group of patients in this phase two study. I'm pleased to say we've now completed the phase three study, and the phase three study, we met the primary and secondary endpoints, the drug was cell safe and well tolerated, and we're planning on uh, filing this drug in the US um, next year. So a fantastic outcome for a team based in Melbourne, accessing Melbourne technology, Melbourne capability, Melbourne manufacturing capability. The, the, the antibodies for this drug were manufactured at our Broadmeadows facility. Um, and, you know, a whole lot of resource that has been developed by CSL with partners such as the state government went into making this effective. Of course, when drug companies have a drug that works in one area, they're always keen to find other areas um, where it will work. And just to finish up on this piece of the story, this is some really interesting work that we've been doing with scientists down at the Alfred Hospital. Um, we, we, over the last several years, have been working with the group there to build a biobank of samples from patients with um, pulmonary fibrosis. And we've been able to use that biobank to look at the role for factor 12 in those diseases. And this is a, an exec excellent example of some data that's just been published now where we've been able to differentiate gene expression in the apex of the lung compared to the base of the lung and show it's different in patients where disease is progressing compared to where it's not. And without going into the details, this, this uh, drug, garadasumab, is now in phase two studies for uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis as well. So uh, a great example of innovation by scientists at CSL in Melbourne, working with a variety of collaborators to take local innovations through phase one, phase two, phase three, and hopefully onto the market, but also pursue other op options for those drugs as well. So that, that's, um, if you like, a bit of context. That's sort of my history in, in the biotech sector and some of the things we're doing at CSL now. So I'd like to sort of step back and take a look at the, the ecosystem, the biotech small company sector here in Australia and think about how it's developed over the last 20 or, or 30 years or so. So I, I would say that, that um, when, when I first worked, started working in biotech back in the mid-90s, um, the ecosystem was, was far from optimal. So if you looked at the players that were involved, there was the academic scientists, there was industry, large pharma, very small number of biotechs, there were the hospitals with the patients, and there was really a lack of connectivity between those groups. They, they did work together. AMRAD was a good example of a company that worked extensively with the academic research groups, but the links to the hospital and the patients weren't really there, uh, and there was a genuine lack of connectivity that I think stopped us from moving forward. And, and really what that did was it meant that there was a big delay in taking great ideas and great innovations and moving them through to the medicos and the treating, uh, the treating medicos and the patients. A long and winding road, if you like, to get to where you want to go. Um, I guess it was also hampered by a lack of skills and understanding of how the industry worked at that time. Although I must say, I think 
in, in retrospect, and I'm not insulting anyone here, I think we were probably a little bit naive in our understanding of how the whole system and uh, the whole process worked, um, but sometimes a bit of naivety leads you to move forward uh, in an unknowing but successful way. Um, so if, if you look forward to... So, so this is where we were, and I think what I'm, what I'm trying to show here is where I think we really want to get to in the future. And the question that I would pose to the people in this room is, is where do you think we are on this journey now? You know, have, have we reached what I've called the future here or are there still pretty big gaps? And I guess I would argue that there are still quite big gaps um, which I think we all need to think about and work on and, and try and build this type of ecosystem here. It's about scientists coming together with industry and patients uh, and treating physicians and investors and developing an ecosystem which can optimise the translation of our innovation. So we need our scientists to be properly funded. Uh, it, it is perfectly clear to me, and I presume many others in this room as well, that the decline in the, the uh, success of basic research grants, the decline in real terms in NHMRC funding and ARC funding is really damaging the future of Australian innovation. There's no question that, in my mind, great medicine comes from great science, and if we don't have the great science and we don't support that, that is ultimately going to really damage our, our opportunity. So we do have things like the MRFF, and I think the governments are really putting in a big effort towards translation, but we need to continue to focus on the, the early stage activities as well. If you look, you know, we need... I'm going to talk a little bit about incubator facilities, industry co-location, that sort of thing. Uh, we need to encourage investment in, in onshore R&D and advanced manufacturing. We need to enhance translational research and medicine, and we need to support precincts. When I put this diagram together, and you look in that piece in the centre, which is where all the pieces of the puzzle overlap, and ask yourself, well, what is that? That is a medical research precinct. That is what you find in Parkville, that is what you find in Boston, that is what you find in Cambridge. That's the space where physicians work closely with scientists, with investors in the next room, thinking about how we can capitalise on the innovations. So we have these great precincts, we just need to develop them further and make sure we can optimise the outcomes. The piece between the scientist and, and industry there, I put a red dot, because that's where I think an incubator exists as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about the CSL incubator shortly, but I think that's really important in terms of bridging that gap between industry and, and, and basic research and science. And I think if we can get that right, then the road to a successful outcome, the road to new medicines for patients in, in really serious need, is much shorter than it was. I did have a straight road there, but I took that away and put that winding road because it's never going to be a straight road. Drug development is hard, it takes a long time, it's expensive, it's highly competitive. But I think if we invest right, we can really make some great strides. So I, I just wanted to look at, uh, you know, that, that process of innovation in, in a sort of more linear way um, and, you know, think about how you, you, you do get from the medical research piece through to the product, the, the things that happen in between, and ask the question about where, where the gaps are you know, what we need to invest in to, to fill those gaps. So I think we're all pretty used to this, this sort of pathway. Um, right at the start, of course, we have our government-funded medical research. Uh, and at the moment, there's quite a lot of funding, I would say, going into assisting those scientists develop what I would call investable opportunities, bringing their research to a point where a, a, a VC or a company will partner and invest with them. And you see a lot of funds like... Pre-seed, proof of concept, gapped buy to build funds um, at the moment. MRFF via Curator is supporting such a fund. And just a few weeks ago, the University of Melbourne, WeHi announced their own early stage funds. And indeed at CSL, we have an accelerator fund that I'll talk about. Those assets either end up in startup ventures uh, or they're licensed to big pharma. Um, often, if they're in a startup venture, you end up with a partnership um, and, you know, you're looking for... for for the product in the end there as well. I think both, path, both, both pathways have um, risks and I would say that I've e experienced firsthand those risks on a number of occasions. So when you're a small company partnering with a large farmer, you know, looks like a fantastic opportunity until there's a change in personnel there, they re-prioritise your portfolio and you find your IP handed back and you've lost 10 years or five, five to 10 years off the development time. 
That's, that can be a real challenge. It doesn't happen all the time, but I would say it happens more often than you get a successful outcome. Of course, the other uh, opportunity or the other pathway is to try and push all the way through with a startup venture, um, and we see some examples of that in Australia at the moment. Rob and I were talking about up there a little earlier, where what is essentially a small startup company is pushing into phase three, you know, at, at great expense. And of course, the the challenge there is, uh, you know, the risk of a lack of skills and resources to get you there ultimately. So these are the challenges, you know. If you, if, if you think of it in a functional sense, as a scientist like I do, what, what does all that mean? What does translation of innovation look like? From my sense and the perspective of CSL, these are really some of the key steps that, that we take. So on the left, you have your basic biomedical research um, through these steps of preclinical validation, lead optimization, translational science, et cetera, et cetera, ultimately through into the clinic. And to support that progress through the clinic, um, you need to have great translational medicine capability. You need to have great um, manufacturing product development capability. This process relies on, you know, activities that are highly regulated. So you need a GMP manufacturing facility. You need access to GLP toxicology. And if you put all those things together, you can get through phase uh, two, phase three, and end up with a translated product. And down the bottom there on the right-hand side, for example, is a... a, a um, factor that we developed to treat haemophilia B patients uh, several years ago now, but which um, has been a revolution in the treatment of those patients and, and now is the, the number one therapy to treat those uh, people um, that is available. So that's, that's really the, the pathways that are there when you think about them in a linear sense. So what, what, are, what are some of the gaps that I see when I look across those pathways and, and how can we close those gaps? And... Um, you know, what I've chosen to do is give you some examples of how CSL is working with our partners to try and close some of these gaps. But I fully understand there's probably many people in this room that have the same you know, long-term view of where the sector can get to and are, are thinking about these same issues in, the, in, in a similar or a different way from, from what we are and in investing to try and take us forward in the space as well. So, you know, as I indicated earlier, clearly, clearly the more investment we can get, the better off we'll be. And that needs to be support for both basic research and translational research. And one of the things I think we really need to work to do is to bridge that gap between industry scientists and academic scientists. I, I, after all of these years, I'm still amazed um, at the lack of understanding amongst some of my academic colleagues of what the drug dis discovery process looks like and, and, and sometimes they're disdain for the science that goes on within an industry setting. And speaking from, as someone who's worked on both sides, I can tell you that the, the quality is as high, if not higher, on the industry side, because it has to be. You know, we're not putting drugs into mice, we're putting drugs into humans, and if those drugs don't work and have adverse consequences, you know, that's not a good thing for us. But encouraging an understanding from both sides, I think, is really important. We need as much VC and accelerator investment we can, and we need direct industry investments in startups as well. We need more investable opportunities. Uh, you know, I, I, I see, and I, I expect others see here, you know, opportunities that are brought to us that are really underdeveloped, and, and that underdevelopment is because of general lack of understanding of what it takes to get to that next step. So I think there's a real role for industry and other people in this room to go back into the academic sector, to, to talk to the people that are the innovators and help guide them along that pathway, to, to help them understand where they need to get to, to have what we would think of as an investable opportunity. And there's a couple of activities that we've got going on in that space. I won't talk about it later, but one thing is that we've recently done, we've recently taken our, our, our biologics library and set up um, a centre for biologic therapy discovery in Weehai, uh, that, that's just for the partners at the moment, but hopefully at some stage that centre will become more widely available for, for groups around Australia. We need to really focus on developing the innovation ecosystem. Uh, that includes people, skills, infrastructure and technology. And we need to look at building GXP capabilities as well. Just keeping my eye on the time, so I'll move forward. So in terms of some of the things that, that we've been doing, and I know, and, and which I think are important to do, and others are doing as well, um, I'll take you through some of those now. So we're, we're certainly investing more of our R&D dollar um, uh, in the early, um, early innovation um, stage. Uh, we're doing it both here in Australia as one of the 
um, five partners involved in the brand and buy catalyst funds. So I, I think those funds are you know, totaling seven or eight hundred million dollars and CSL has about 60 or 70 million dollars in there. And we see that as an opportunity not only for us to see the pipeline of opportunities that are coming through from the brand and group of organisations, but also to put our money where our mouth is and invest in these small companies. We also have partnerships with StartX at Stanford, the uh, uh, Science Centre in Philadelphia and Base Launch and Biopol in Switzerland as well. Just as an example of how companies um, can partner with others to invest in small startups, you, we've been working with the University of Melbourne for many years on a vaccine for periodontal disease, a really nasty condition that's poorly treated at the moment. Ultimately, that technology didn't work for us. It didn't fit within our, you know, our focus areas. But we thought the, the preclinical data certainly was strong enough to warrant someone testing it in the clinic. So together with the University of Melbourne and Brandon, we set up Denteric, and um, Denteric is well on its way, um, despite issues with the uh, pandemic, of getting its vaccine candidate into patients next year sometime. So we think that's an example of how companies like us can invest in the local um, biotech sector. One of the things that we do do as well is we look for really early stage opportunities in medical research institutes and we fund those opportunities and we give the people that are working on them access to our scientists um, and, and our advice. And we think that that will help us create more investable opportunities. So these are two year funding packages, they're pre-asset stage novel targets, therapeutics, they can be in a range of different areas and, as I said, are, are focused on engagement with CSL scientists. So what we see this doing is really creating a, a pool of opportunities that we can move into our own portfolio at some time in the future. But equally, if we, if we do create value and it's ultimately not within our therapeutic areas of interest, we're very happy to see these um, developments partnered and commercialised, translated um, by others. So this has been a really successful program for us, which started in Australia, um, moved to, to Central Europe and the US, um, and in the last round, eight out of our ten successful applications came from France, which I think was a, a, a pretty interesting situation for us to find ourselves in. Um, in terms of, you know, the, con contributing to the development of skills and infrastructure and technology, we made the decision about, um, you know, 15 years ago now, actually, uh, someone was telling me it was 15 years to the day, um, to move our research group, our CSL research group, into the Parkville precinct. You know, we, we're only uh, six kilometres away, maybe less, up, up behind the zoo in Parkville, but that was a huge gap, as it turned out, and if you want to engage if you want to reap the benefits of a high quality medical research precinct, you have to be there. You have to be right in that space. So we moved our group down to, uh, to the building you can see here, which is on the Bio 21 campus, the University of Melbourne. We have about 4,000 square metres there. We have 150, 160 scientists there. They're doing all types of research that contribute to the discovery and development of drugs. Uh, and we have multiple collaborations with, with institutes in the precinct, hospitals in the precinct and others around Australia. You know, and, and our one learning from this is that precincts, the ability to walk out the door and talk to a physician scientist who's treating the patient that you're developing a drug for, just has enormous advantages. And so we've, we've doubled down on, on, um, on this, this site and uh, you know, we've doubled our size actually since we're, we've been there. But not only actually have we doubled down on having our research uh, within the precinct, um, the success of, of the group there and, and the value of being co-located has really driven us to take the decision to ultimately close down our site in Poplar Road and move all of the company um, headquarters, all of our uh, executive, a lot of our product development people, our commercial group, up to the top of Elizabeth Street to really be in the heart of the precinct where we can engage. So, to, to you know, this project's been going on for a while, and actually, there's as as we speak here, there is the illumination event where the big CSL sign at the top is being turned on. I'm happy to be here. Um, <laughs> so, so that's that's a real milestone for the project. But one of the things when we looked at that building, we thought to ourselves, what can we do in this building to really benefit the biotech sector and the local startup community? And at that point, we engaged with, the, with WeHi and the University of Melbourne, 
and we came up with a concept of a, a, a partnership to develop a biotech incubator. And lo and behold, a few years later, we have a $95 million project which will be located across two floors of this new building. It'll be an incubator run by an independent operator, not by one of the partners. It'll have space for up to 40 startup companies um, and the launch date, we're targeting 2024. Um, we're hoping it's earlier than that, hopefully uh, late 2023, Matani, thank you. Um, but I think it's a really, it's a really exciting initiative. Um, we've had fantastic support from the state government I think the state government and Breakthrough Victoria, who are investing in startups themselves, understand the value of having a capability there um, to really support those companies. So we're making a lot of progress. We were doing a tour of the building there the other day, and as I said, the lights are going on. When I look at the incubator, we, we think it has all the key ingredients to make it successful. A ahead of this program, we, we looked at all of the incubator clusters around the world, all of the academic you know, the really strong academic translational sites and looked at what it was that were making those successful and, you know, asked ourselves, well, can we meet those criteria here? Can we offer that same capability at, at a site in Parkville? And, and you can see there, every, every one of those boxes is ticked. So we think it's fantastic for small companies to be co-located with large companies. We think them, it, it's great that they have access to affordable wet lab space and support services, facilitated introduction to investors, mentoring, proximity to the CBD, all of those things that can really help a little startup make the transition. Um, we we are, are, are doing this because we believe in the ecosystem, we believe in the precinct. Um, we don't, CSL, these companies don't have to be in our therapeutic areas of interest. Um, they just have to be based on really high quality science and they have to have a strong investment base. But uh, there's been a lot of interest and I think um, we're very comfortable that this will be a thriving um, incubator within a relatively short space of time. Um, so just, just to finish up, uh, you know, I think one of the things that we've learned over the years at CSL is that if you're not doing open innovation, if you're not reaching out and engaging with the broader medical research community, then ultimately you won't be competitive and, and you will fail. So we've really made a, a big effort over the last several years to develop a, an external innovation strategy and that's been led by Marta Dombrain who has, who has done a fantastic job and the pillars of that strategy that you can see here. But for us, it's all about engagement, it's about developing the ecosystem, um, building skills, all of the things that, that you need to, to really be successful in translation. So I guess just, just uh, to finish up, I'd say I think there's been a, a lot of progress over the last 30 years. I think we've learnt a lot and I think those learnings now are really starting to impact the way that we're doing things. I think there's a lot of people here now who have a lot more experience, who, have, who really understand the drug dis development process. I think we're at a point in time where the investors are there and the dollars are there, although that does tend to go up and down a little bit. But I, I guess I'm really hopeful about the future for the small biotech sector and the future for you know, our ability to translate medical research for the benefit of the patients that we want to treat. So with that, I thank you for your time. <laughs> Do you want me to answer a few questions? <laughs> Move over there, Andrew. So Andrew, thank you for a fantastic speech, Andrew. You've improved a lot since I first saw you speaking <laughs> 30 years ago. Um, we, we, we are running short on time, believe it or not, because you are loquacious. But I have got one, one question that I can ask, and we have time over drinks and also in the panel session later to ask Andrew some questions. But there was one that came through that I'd like to ask you. It's uh, from someone in the audience. Andrew, what have you learnt from CSL's global collaborators that Australia could emulate to improve translation of research? Um... I think one of the things that is really obvious is the um, extent to which um, institute academic groups internationally embrace entrepreneurship um, and, and, I guess, innovation. So if you look at, at the US and, and increasingly in Europe, there's such a focus on, on you know, innovation, on translation, on entrepreneurship um, that you know, when we think about how we partner in the US, we have to, we have to think about it in a different way because the environment's so, so different. So what I would say is a lesson from overseas is that, you know, one of the things that's critical if you want the ecosystem to develop is that you have to develop the right mentality and the mindset within our, our uh, fantastic universities and research institutes. Fantastic. 
Thank you, Angie. Thank you for a great talk. Thank you. As I said, we will have time, hopefully at the end of this, and definitely over drinks, to talk to Angie more. And that last answer to the question is a great segue to the speaker that's coming up. I know that many of you in the audience, because we track you, uh, have downloaded the new Bionics Institute podcast, MedTech Talks, where I interviewed some leaders in the field about their journeys. Two themes have consistently come from those discussions. One, how hard it is to attract funding for early stage research. And two, the lack of people who are willing to take risks on early concepts. Fortunately, we heard from Andrew that that may not be the future, but the people we've spoken to, that's their reality. Our next speaker is very familiar with this scenario. Associate Professor Tom Oxley studied medicine at Monash University, specialised in interventional neurology, and completed a PhD in neural engineering at the University of Melbourne. He is the co-founder and CEO of Synchron, a company set up to develop the Stentrode, an implantable medical device that can provide thought-controlled actions to people who are paralysed or have severely restricted movement. To put Synchron into some context, I know many of you in the audience have heard all about Elon Musk and Neuralink and what he's going to do for the world. The Stentrode is well ahead of Neuralink and is currently in clinical trials. This Australian-developed technology leads the world in the emerging area of brain-computer interfacing. Unfortunately, Tom was unable to join us in person from his home in New York, and his butt has been more than kind to make a presentation via video. Notwithstanding that, his colleague, Dr Nick Opie, CTO and co-founder of Synchron, is here tonight and can answer one or two audience questions after the video or if we're running over time, after drinks tonight. I'd now like to hand over to Professor Tom Oxley. Hi everyone, Tom Oxley here from Synchron in New York City. Very excited to be here and chat for a few minutes about our brain-computer interface technology and give a little bit of a sneak peek on the 10-year journey from University of Melbourne spin-out to um, now small growing corporation. So Synchron, I just want to take you through the vision and the product and what we're building. Really, the vision of our company is to decode the brain. The way that we're going to do that is by reaching all corners of the brain using the brain's natural highways, the, the blood vessels. But our goal, our ultimate vision, is to build a hands-free computing, personal computing platform which I think is an inevitable movement in society away from handheld devices to having directly brain-controlled devices. Why is this important? Because there are 100 million people in the world who can't use handheld devices like you or I, who are in desperate need of some form of control of technology that does not depend on their bodies. So here's the concept. The concept is that people who live with paralysis um, are unable to control their body like you or I. Um, there's a range of conditions that cause this. The most common is stroke, but also motor neuron disease, spinal cord injury, and other more common things like rheumatoid arthritis that stop our ability to use our hands effectively. So the concept is that we go into the brain through a blood vessel, we get to the part of the brain called the motor cortex, we deploy the device in there, can record local brain activity, and then it converts that into a USB Bluetooth signal that comes out of the brain and is able to control digital devices. This is what the Stentrode head looks like, self-expanding nitinol stent with a sensor array. We had to completely uh, re-overhaul how manufacturing of stents is conducted because we had to have two layers of metal and required an insulation layer. So essentially we had to come up with a mechanism of 3D printing multiple metal components into stent, which had not been done before. This was the final result. We've called it the Stentrode, and it has both nitinol insulation layer and platinum um, sensors on the scaffold, and we have, we're, we're figuring out how to deliver these safely into the brain. Put it all together, you have a self-expanding device next to the brain area called the motor cortex, which is the part of the, the command center that controls our muscles in our body. It comes out of the brain through a natural hole, which is a blood vessel out of the holes in the base of the skull, 
and then that plugs into a device in the chest that sends out the information wirelessly through Bluetooth. This was our first patient, so this is an angiogram that shows the blood vessels spinning around in the brain, and you can see, if you look closely there, the device outline coming out of the brain in the largest blood vessel in the brain called the superior sagittal sinus. Once it's in place, we then um, decla or classify the types of brain signals in the brain that are related to certain types of movements, and they're distributed in different regions. One bit's for your hand, one bit's for your shoulder, one bit's for your foot, etc. So we are essentially building a dictionary of the brain to decode different types of movements from the brain. And once we can classify that, it doesn't actually matter what your brain was connected to before because we're bringing out the data wirelessly and you can then use those classified types of movements to control external devices. We turn this part of the brain into a joystick, essentially. So we've been working, we started as a research group and the, one of the initial problems was what does the brain signal look like when you record it from the blood vessel? It looks very similar to a surface array that's implanted through open brain surgery, but there are some differences here. And so we're in a very fortunate position now of um, patenting and making proprietary the types of classifications of brain data that we see in a way that can be converted into digital device control. So here's an example of one of our patients. You can see his hands are not moving. We're converting those classified types of brain activity into outputs that enable him controlling a keyboard. And he, this is a man with motor neuron disease who just sends a message to his wife to let her know that he's in need of something. And so she then gets the buzz from the phone. So previously, where patients with have motor neuron disease, for example, they completely depend on their caregivers or partners to come and try and interpret what it is they're trying to say by giving them access to messaging, something that you and I take absolutely for granted, it really incredibly opens up your capacity to be independent in the world again. So we're trying to give back the power of digital technology to people who don't have the mechanisms of normal use of those devices, which is the hand. Okay, this is a journey along the way since 2011 when we wrote the first patent, Nick Opie and I, the co-founders of the company, um, all the way through to 2023, where we're heading towards a pivotal study. This is probably a bit scary in terms of how long it takes to bring a medical device all the way through to market, and we're still not there. We've still got a long way to go, but these early years, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, you know, from 2011 through to 2015, were benchtop fabrication, animal studies, really hard, hard medical research and science to be done before we knew that we had a product that needed to then move into a commercial or more development type stage. That happened with the Series A round of financing, which I had a lot of trouble doing in Australia. I actually came to the US to do a uh, medical fellowship um, in this uh, neurosurgical procedure. And it was when I got to New York, I met, I met investors who were willing to take the risk. We didn't quite have that risk appetite in Australia um, at that point. And then, so we spent that three million in the Series A to get beyond the animal stage into the first in human stage. And then about 18 months ago, we raised a total $50 million Series B round of financing, which is now carrying us into the next stage, which is moving towards the later clinical pivotal trial stage, discussions with FDA, discussions with Medicare, figuring out reimbursement, the business model, and getting ready for commercial launch. Um, the team has stayed small for a very long time until the Series B financing, where we've jumped from nine people to 55 people, and half of the team is here in Brooklyn, and half the team is in Melbourne. So I'm going to talk a little bit about product development, just to give a little bit of a window into those early years about some of the challenges. This was us in the, in the Howard Flurry Laboratories, just opposite Royal Melbourne Hospital in the Parkville Precinct. Um, this is Nick and I in the angiography machine, and Steve and Gil are there as well. We were doing a lot of um, sheep work, trying to demonstrate that this device could be put into the brain through the blood vessels, that it was safe, that it worked, and we didn't have the benefit of advanced manufacturing techniques. I mean, Nick was essentially making these devices by hand in our lab in the Department of Medicine at the University of Melbourne. And you know, just to give a sense of where we came from, we were taking off-the-shelf products that were basically in the rubbish bin, cleaning them, repurposing them, fabricating them by hand until we eventually figured out how to do this in a good manufacturing practice technique that was suitable for human use. Um, it was a hard slog. We were basically, one of the issues we had was the sheep's heads weren't big enough to get into the blood vessels 
So we would be going out to the farmers, finding the sheep and pointing out the sheep that had the biggest heads and then driving them back ourselves um, from the farm. This was what it took to make things happen. This is just an, an analogy of the sort of things that you have to do to make things happen early, early in the stage of you know, your development. Eventually, we pieced enough together to have a really impactful publication in a high-quality journal. And then, you know, from there on, that's what was formed the basis for the Series A round of financing. Um, so, you know, advice around patenting. Uh, this was our first patent. And I just, you know, wanted to make the point that you have to be aggressive with patenting. You have to get second opinions. You're probably existing within an institution. The institution doesn't always know what you need get second advice, get external advice, and patent aggressively. Um, yeah, so, you know, just to quickly make the point, going from academic clinician to, you know, commercial hats is very challenging, and there are lots of different pressures coming in. I think the environment is going in a really positive direction in Australia. There's more support for entrepreneurial attitudes, but sometimes you come up against headwinds, and they're challenging. Um, so, you know, I would advise everyone that you have to go out there and negotiate aggressively for what you're trying to do and always get second opinions. Uh, just to make the point that you know publishing is really important if you're doing a deeply technical, sometimes you don't want to publish, sometimes you want to be in full stealth, sometimes you want to show the world what you're doing to attract investment and attract um, people to recruit. Uh, that was very important for us. And I think one of the things that's really for me was uh, time and time again, making pitches to investors, it's very challenging. You keep getting told by very, very smart people that what you're doing will not work for really good reasons, and often for three or four really good reasons, times 200. And you have to have a belief that you're doing something that you think is worthwhile, that you think is going to work, and you've got to find a way to keep going forward. Um, Things happen along the way. You have to be ready to be responsive. After our Nature Biotech paper came out, it was picked up by President Barack Obama in a completely unexpected event, and suddenly that led to a range of interest from investors, and we had to jump on that straight away. So you never know quite when things are going to come your way, and you have to be ready to you know, ride the waves that are coming. And after those 200 no's, it just takes one investor to say yes. And this is Martin Deek, who led the Series A round from Neurotechnology Investors, who's now become chairman of our board and a very close mentor of mine. It just takes one person who believes in what you're doing, and then all the other doubters will disappear into the background. Um, just to finish up, so uh, we landed our Series B. You know, we were not in self mode. We were, had a very active uh, idea of going out there and making as much noise as we can. That's actually how the Series B happened. We got into the Wall Street Journal. We were telling our story, and the investors came to us. And so all the doors that I had knocked on had said no. When people come to you, it just seems to be a different psychology. That was the experience for us. So I think I'm running out of time. I don't want. I think this is just the start of your conference. So I'm going to try and finish this up, but. Building a culture of excellence has been a real challenge and a joy. And so we've gone from a very small team to now hitting about 55 people. Um, an incredible journey. I would say mentorship is one of the most um, important aspects of growth and in leadership, and especially when you're walking around um, blind corners. You know, the one that really springs to mind is actually not there, but it is... Um, it is uh, the CEO of a company called Saluda, John Parker, who gave me really good advice early on about how to negotiate for license terms. So you're facing things you don't know how to do. Go and ask people who have done it before. Even if you get five minutes of their time, it can be lifelong advice that you can then grab onto. Um, finally, you know, the journey from the lab to then learning how to do storytelling and then presenting, it's been an interesting journey. A really critical part of raising capital is the storytelling and being able to present. Um, that's, been a big, that's been a big joy of what's uh, the last few years. Just to finish with for you guys, the three things that I wish I'd known when I was getting started. Number one was the basics of negotiation. It's really simple. Always have a walk away. Never enter a negotiation where you don't know what your walk away is. Otherwise, they'll squeeze you for a really bad deal and you're going to be miserable. Number two, I mentioned earlier, always get external advice. This is especially true for when you're looking at doing patents. And then finally, you have to be able to pitch often. You have to be able to be told that you're wrong. You have to be able to embrace criticism and get back up and keep going. So 
Um, thanks for having me here and good luck everyone uh, with what endeavors you're chasing and I wish everyone the best and I look forward to being back in Australia soon. Thank you. Well, that was a fantastic talk. Nick, can you come up? Nick Opie, co-founder of Synchron. There's about five questions here. We've got time for one. But there's a commonality. I'll let you stand there and answer the question. The first question I've got here three times is, when is this going to be approved for human use? Yeah, the question we always get, right? Uh, hopefully in the next five years. So we've started uh, and completed our first human trial in Australia. There were four patients. Uh, they went for a year starting in 2019. All of the patients were able to control digital technology with one of these devices just using naturally occurring thoughts. There were no uh, serious adverse events. The, the trials are you know, a huge success. From the back of that, that's where we got sort of FDA approval to then move into the US and start a trial over there while we're continuing doing trials in Australia and you know, expanding the sites to Queensland, New South Wales, as well as Victoria. Uh, medical devices, many of you know, is a long process, so we have to you know, do this initial trial, then the pivotal trial, and once that's all, all gone uh, to plan, then, then we get the approval to, to sell it in, in the US, and then sort of Australia and the TGA will closely follow. So uh, please be patient. We're working as fast as we can, and uh, hopefully we'll get out uh, very soon. One last question before I ask you to sit down. Of course. Well, two, actually. One is, why are you better than Neuralink? <laughs> and secondly, how much will it take to get your product to the market? Uh, how much time, energy, effort, dollars. cost, dollars? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, you know, more than we'd like, but probably not as much as it, it should be. So we're we're pretty efficient and, and good with our coin. Um, you know, we're Australian. We can. You know, we came from making things on a shoestring. We're pretty good at figuring out how to how to get the most out of our budgets. Um, so. Uh, a lot, and we have to raise, and we've had to keep raising, and that's why we've done done more of them. We think with the the funding we've got, plus a little bit more in the in the next round, then we should be able to get to, to pivotal where where we can start, you know, being uh, you know revenue positive and start making some, some money off the devices, um, which will then obviously fund the, the other research. And your initial question, why are we better than Neuralink? I mean, I think I think everyone who's in this space whether it's brain machine faces or cochlear implants or whatever, needs to be, uh, you know, take that hat off there to them. You know, you're all doing amazing work. Uh, I think there's a lot of patients that need help and there's many different solutions for them. So I think Neuralink, you know, it's just a different way of addressing the same problem and I, I wish them all the best. Um, they're not us and not Australian. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you for that very diplomatic answer, Nick. I'd now like to ask the panellists to join me on the stage. Firstly, Andrew, if you can come up. Maybe come up this side and sit on the seats over there. Uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Michelle McIntosh, Director of the Medicines Manufacturing Innovation Centre and Theme Leader at the Monash Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences, otherwise known as MIPS. Professor McIntosh is an award-winning scientist known for her inhaled oxytocin research which promises to transform maternal health care, particularly in developing countries where price, injecting capabilities and cold storage facilities present barriers to safe and effective childbirth. Welcome, Michelle. I'd like to welcome Dr. Megan O'Connor, Managing Director of Kantara Consulting, who recently wrote a seminal piece published by Innovation Australia about how grant funding in Australia needs to change to translate our world-class research into commercial outcomes. Kantara is a biotech-focused consultancy that brings top-tier government relations and project funding services to the Australian SME biotech community. Welcome, Megan. <laughs> and last, but certainly not least, please welcome George Kenley, co-founder and chief operating officer of SIA Medical, a company creating technology to revolutionise the diagnosis and management of neurological conditions with a focus on epilepsy. Earlier this year, SIA was named Startup of the Year by the Governor of Victoria and recognised as one of the, Australia's fastest growing technology businesses in the Deloitte Technology Fast 50 list. Welcome, George.
Welcome, Michelle, Megan, Andrew, George. I'm going to start by asking you the first question, Michelle. However, before I start, if anyone wants to ask a question of the panel at the end, please send it through Slido. You see that up on the screen. You can take a picture with your phone and send the questions through. I'll get them on the iPad and I can pass them on to the people at the end. So, starting with you, Michelle. Michelle, we recently had a fabulous conversation on the, on the podcast and in it you raised the issue of how difficult it was to source initial funding. I wanted to ask you briefly to take us through the funding journey that you had, the lucky break that you referred to on the call and how that's since led to acceleration of your research. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, so this is all related to the, the research that um, I've been working on for probably the last... 14 years or so in the oxytocin and making an inhaled product of oxytocin that's specifically targeting low resource settings. And so the project funding started off with a $19,000 um, grant from a, a small group of uh, was the, uh, trustees, perpetual trustees at the time. Uh, and that $19,000 is probably one of the most important pieces of funding that we had because we just had nothing to, to do work at, at that stage. And soon after that, we were fortunate to... Uh, and, and it's interesting how many parallels there are in the conversations. Um, I was told not to apply for funding to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation because the idea was far too boring and they fund blue sky ideas. But they did fund us for $100,000 and that allowed us to keep going. And then we were successful in getting the next round of funding, which was a million dollars. And that meant I could hire a project manager, which was really important to be able to keep that going. I'm a TNR academic, so I teach as well as do research. Um, there was a strategic change in direction, so that happens with your philanthropic funders as well as commercial partners. Sometimes there's just a change in direction, uh, and they decided they were no longer investing in development of new products in maternal health. Uh, and we went through a difficult stage. We found a, a couple more smaller grants, uh, but a very challenging stage. And the, the lucky break for us was that um, the, the gentleman who owned the building uh, that I do research in in Parkville um, came to visit and he is... Um, fl flavour of the, the month at the moment is Canadian philanthropists. <laughs> uh, not the same uh, particular philanthropist, but... He owned the building and he was visiting the dean of our faculty at the time and he heard about the project and he and his wife had a foundation that focused on maternal health, education and climate change and the fact that we were combining maternal health with education really sparked his interest. Must have been close to tax time so he just wrote a cheque there and then <laughs> Uh, literally that day, there was no ask. He, he just wrote a cheque for like $100,000 and said, here, this will get started. But then he also uh, subsequently went on to fund us for $3.5 million, which was matched funding. He said it was contingent on us finding matched funding and that is a great way to be able to leverage funding through other programs. So I know I'm conscious of time uh, and I've been asked to keep keep responses brief, but we have since gone through to phase 2B clinical trials, uh, raised over $35 million to date for the development of the program. It's still within the university at this stage and we probably have another $30 million or so to raise um, to hopefully uh, get a product to market. Fantastic. Megan, uh, your recent article <laughs> certainly resonated with me and I understand many people across the country. It highlighted some examples of countries around the world that have gotten the government funding models right. Can you expand on what you think Australia could adopt from those models? Yes, so, uh, you know, the, the, the commercialisation pathway in medical research is very long and very complicated and, and risky. So I think... Getting the funding mix right is incredibly important. And that also not only includes 
funding universities, but also industry and supporting industry along that process, industry um, participants that are taking that long, risky pathway. Um, so some models that are highlighted and some um, of some countries that are highlighted that do have very strong industry programs was the, uh, the SBRI program. Um, the US started this program and this is a small business research incentive program where the government essentially acts as a buyer and offers research contracts to industry, small business participants to undertake uh, research and more applied research uh, that the, the government, the, the, um, uh, the community needs. And I think the government, uh, and since the UK has also adopted that model in 2001, and from that, uh, today the UK, uh, within Europe, 30% of biotechs reside in the UK. And, and, you know, part of that is part of this policy setting where, in, where, um, where industry players are, are supported. And I think, uh, obviously, government can play a very significant role in being a buyer um, in any industry, but particularly it does serve a place in the medical space, the health, health space, which, you know, a lot of which the government plays in as, as the customer. Um, another example closer to home is Singapore. And Singapore has really just grown their industry from nothing to a real world player within 20 years, which in the scheme of things in general, particularly this industry, is, not a, is a short amount of time. Um, so they announced their you know, directive, their policy agenda to, to create a biotech industry in 2000. And the first kind of initiatives were to attract international foreign investment, um, both companies and also researchers to Singapore to create that, that, um, that, that system and grow that strong industry um, sector. Uh, and then they built infrastructure, significant infrastructure, which made it very quick and relatively cheap in, this, in the scheme of things for companies to come and set up and start manufacturing quite quickly. Um, and then they've also um, uh, had significant research commercialisation programs as well. And so today, um, some of you may know that Singapore, eight out of the ten top pharmaceutical companies have facilities in Singapore. And um, four of the top ten drugs in terms of revenue generating are manufactured in Singapore. So that's an example of how government can play a, a massive role. Um, and I'll just a, a comment on the local front. If, you know, if in the policy setting, if we really want, you know, we want to grow and support the industry here in Australia, we have to remember that particularly in this industry, it's a global market. So if the, any policy settings that we have here have to be globally competitive. Um, and they also have to be stable because um, businesses in general, if you're making, if you want to attract businesses from overseas to set up significant um, facilities and business operations here, they need to have that confidence the settings are going to be there for a while. And also, if you want to keep our companies here and not let them go overseas, we need that competitive setting on a global scale. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> in, a, in your turn, George. Okay, sorry. So, you co-founded Sia Medical with Dr. Dean Freestone and Professor Mark Cook in 2017. The company has been, for some of you in the audience know, incredibly successful. You're now generating significant revenues. You have over 200 staff and have recently set up operations in the US and the UK. How did you overcome the barriers of funding and growth in the early days of your business? And can you tell us what the challenges you face now? I can. <laughs> um, so in the early days, we were very fortunate to have a uh, focus on early investment through the usual friends, families and fools <laughs> avenue. Um, that really set us up with... It, we found uh, 
like-minded people who had a belief in what we were trying to do and how we were trying to get it. But it also kind of created and fostered an environment whereby we could make mistakes and it was a welcoming environment whereby we weren't going to be drawn across the coals just for that to happen because that isn't inevitably going to happen when you're trying to find your feet uh, commercially in these environments. So finding that kind of community who we could both leverage off in regards to mentoring, um, but also who we could test ideas against and yeah, inevitably have uh, faith in us when we did inevitably have mistakes. But one thing that we were also very fortunate in, and it's something that I wasn't aware at the time, I don't come from a medical or a health or a research background, but we were able to achieve reimbursement for the services that we provide within six months of actually spinning up operation. So from the investment that we had so early on, we were able to make that actually last a hell of a lot longer because we could back it off with uh, investment, uh, with reimbursement that we were able to achieve in market. So that meant we could stay the course, we could concentrate on what our core business was and what we were trying to achieve rather than being distracted or we still were because we still had to go out to investment at points of time. But the, the effort and the concentration and the distraction that going out to raise capital can be, and it's not your core, we're, your core, our core business is to help people with epilepsy, our core business is not to raise funds, but it's inevitable that you have to do that. So being able to maximise the funds that we had, reduce the number of investment rounds that we've needed to undertake really meant that we could kind of get our footing, get a grounding and really solidify our business in Australia. Um, we then have been able to leverage just recently uh, a large investment through B Breakthrough Victoria, which has been pivotal in us eventually now finally being able to expand our business internationally. So we've recently spun up an office in the UK earlier this year and we'll be entering into the US market at the end of this year as well. Um, so that has meant that our challenges have changed from early days when we were bootstrapping existing hardware and re getting reimbursement in the Australian market. So now we're, we're challenging in with uh, su global supply chain, uh, manufacturing at scale, being able to understand the uh, US health insurance uh, landscape and how we actually enter the market. And the UK market, how do you enter that? It's very different from Australia. So they're fun challenges that we're, we're up against, but it's really about growth and our ability to scale to meet that demand that we're hoping to create. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> your turn, Andrew. Uh, as you mentioned in your talk, you've worked for organisations of very different sizes throughout your career. Can you tell us what the difference was between large companies and small startups? And you mentioned it briefly, but if you can embellish, in terms of access to funding and culture, and also what have you found common to both? Uh, well, so look, I mean, common to both, and and I guess at a at a really fundamental level, um, they're the same. You've just got two separate groups of investors that you have to convince that putting their money into your R and D is a good idea. So, I guess it's just a lot more cutthroat for the small companies. You know, the only thing they do is their R&D, if they don't get the money, the company seeks to exist. But nevertheless, their investors, their VCs, their angel investors have to be convinced um, that they're on the right pathway. For us, you know, our shareholders are looking for a return on their investment as well. So, you know, we, we constantly have to be able to justify the level that we spend on R&D in terms of a return to those investors. You know, the, the difference for us is that it might be a difference between 9, 10, 12% of revenue on uh, R&D versus 15% of revenue on R&D. So R&D goes on, but it's the level of the investment. So, but, but ultimately, it, at, and at a fundamental level, you know, you're trying to keep your investors happy and trying to help them understand that if you're not innovating um, and you're not moving forward, then ultimately you're not going to be competitive. Fantastic, thank you. <laughs> Michelle, we're starting back with you again. Um, from your experience in your current role at MIPS, what do you believe are the solutions to the challenges faced by organisations and inventors seeking to create products that will improve human health? Um, I think 
probably one of the biggest challenges is the, the lack of appetite for risk in Australia. Uh, and a fundamental culture of failure in Australia is not viewed as um, a learning experience. It's like if you failed at a, a leading a major program or your technology failed, it might be nothing to do with your skills as a, a, a leader or a scientist. Um, but, you know, in the US, you know, you really, you haven't, you haven't done startups and biotechs until you've failed about eight times and then maybe the ninth or tenth time. Uh, and so I think it's a cultural thing around appetite for, for risk and, and, and accepting that failure is part of the journey. Great. Thanks very much. Over to you, Megan. In your, art in your uh, recent article, you made mention of the newly announced $1.5 billion medical manufacturing fund, and you mentioned that it was a fantastic opportunity to strengthen Australia in the biotech industry. What do you think should be some of the key funding principles of this fund to best support and grow the Australian industry? Um, yeah, it is a very exciting uh, opportunity that's, um, that, that we have. Uh, first, I would like to see all industry participants participants be able to access the, the programs that come out of the fund. Um, uh, and that would include um, the pre-revenue companies. So uh, as, as we're all very much aware, uh, the industry is mainly made up of SMEs. So 80% um, in, of the industry are SMEs. Uh, and most of them, majority of them, are pre-revenue. So typically, that that in the past, uh, manufacturing-focused uh, programs have had a requirement that the companies need to be revenue generating and already have customers in that market. Um, if that was the case, it would just shut out a lot of the industry to access um, th that that great lots of lot of funding there. Um, at the same time, I would like love to see. It's a, it's a significant fund, able to make a significant impact. So I would love to see some big projects, some big ambitious projects that can make a difference, inspire us, put us on the, you know, move the dial. Um, and I think a success metric would be obviously to strengthen the industry and that would, one of the metrics there would be from growing, able to grow small companies to medium companies and then the medium companies to large, other large companies, just like CSL. Um, because with that growth, that's where we're going to get that skill development, both the breadths of skills and then the depths of skills that we need to be able to commercialise research effectively in Australia. Great. Thank you very much. Over to you again, George. So, you, as you mentioned before, and we mentioned earlier, you've been very successful in Australia. You're now pushing into the Northern Hemisphere. You've recently announced an investment from Breakthrough Victoria to support you in that activity. What role do you see for government for internationalising Australian businesses, which is a journey that you're on? Um, a huge role, uh, and in multiple different kind of facets. So, for us, in our particular situation, so they're basically a consumer... Um, they are also a cheerleader for us in, um, and they're also uh, fostering an ecosystem that, in which we are one of many that are operating. So with us, they're a consumer. So we uh, have a reimbursed service that we offer across Australia. So they are basically helping us to deliver that service to uh, citizens of Australia, to, with those with living with epilepsy. So that has allowed us to build our business here in Australia. We are in home soil whereby we can test what we've provided, really refine our commercialisation strategy. Um, but they've also then shifted into a cheerleading mode for us as well with the, the Breakthrough Victoria kind of funding. So our launch into the UK recently was uh, represented and um, attended by the Victorian Governor. Um, and we've had great representation from uh, VicGov uh, in regards to that and it's really kind of lifted our standing in the UK um, kind of NHS sector because we've had to, we've had someone who's really endorsed what we do and really endorsed what we do here in Australia. We could probably could have done that our, our, on, a, on our own but it would have been far more difficult um, and it's something that we're really wanting to leverage off 
in regards to fostering an ecosystem that we operate. Um, we've taken advantage of the R&D tax incentive, R&D tax incentive loans. We've been part of BMTH, MRFF, which has really helped us kind of take calculated uh, risks, or not risk, but calculated steps um, by leveraging off those and allowing us to really extend our runway so that we can still continue to trade. Great, thank you. My last question, there's a few that's <laughs> backed up on the slide that I'll come to, but for Andrew, the recent jobs and skills summit and announcement about attracting more talent to Australia uh, made a big, big push about that. Can you tell us more about talent recruitment at CSL and in your opinion, what Australia and Australians can do to encourage the development of the necessarily broad range of skills that you outlined in your talk to successfully develop innovation? So, I, so just in terms of our um, recruitment experiences uh, here in Australia at the moment, I mean, at, at, a, at a basic research level, I think we're really well placed because it, ultimately we're just looking for very good scientists and uh, the research that we're doing um, is not dissimilar from what you see uh, being undertaken. It's just from a different perspective. It's from the perspective of treating patients rather than that basic research. I think, you know, as long as we continue to turn out really high quality young scientists, that, that's a great thing. Where there's an issue, I guess, is in, in the translation piece, in the manufacturing, in the commercialisation. Uh, and I think there's, you know, a lot of opportunity there. We, we, we struggle sometimes to find the right people uh, for those roles, but, but we struggle globally for those roles. It's not just here in Australia. It's exceptionally competitive in the northeast of the US. So com competition for talent, no matter where you are, is really tough. So you've just got to build the talent, and I think there's a big role for, for, for government there. I think um, you know, it was good to hear all the positive noise coming out of the, uh, the summit last week. Um, we know that there are a number of initiatives that can be impactful in the short to medium term. There's MRFF funded ready programs, but we probably need 10 of those. And, and we need the NHMRC and ARC to focus on you know, developing those skills as well. I think in the long term, we really have to invest in STEM and encourage you know, the best and brightest students to get into those careers and think about industry and, and translation as a career. And, you know, we, we support a number of really early, early um, learning type programs. I think the one that we, we're most proud of is we've sponsored the Europe program for, for 10 years now, and that's funding undergraduate scientists to work in a, a lab and academic environment um, instead of at McDonald's or at a cafe somewhere. And, and uh, since we've supported that, we've had almost 500 students come through that program. So I think there is a real role to encourage students early on to think about those types of careers. And then there's a role for government to support the development of the, the, the skills and knowledge from an industry and uh, innovation perspective. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. I've got some questions from the audience. We're, we're, I know we're running out of time and I know people are desperate to eat and get some drinks, but there's a few that have come in. Um, one from a very well-known investor who asked the question, and a very quick answer from the four of you, how can we change public opinion so that government can use taxpayer money to co-invest alongside private capital? I might start with you, George. I've heard you sp speak about this. Wow. <laughs> That's a spicy one. Um, how can... How can we change public opinion so that government can use taxpayer money to co-invest alongside private capital? I don't know if it's, gov if it's public opinion that needs to be changed. No. Uh, maybe it's government. Ah. They need to be willing to take the risk. Yeah. I think um, if, you're, if your business is out there to do good in society, then uh, potentially it's... Uh, uh, yeah, public's already on your side. Anyone else? Yes. What, what I would say to that is I think there's a, a big communication piece there um, in terms of celebrate. We, we do have success stories um, uh, and to celebrate them and make them publicly known, uh, more publicly known and, and household names. And that will, one, both make the appetite for, for taxpayers more willing to invest in biotech 
raise the profile of biotech that we are here and we do we can we are successful um, and then also um, raise the profile within government as well to, to say this is an industry that's worth investing in um, and supporting okay. Michelle yeah, well, uh, I should have tried to cut in earlier because <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was going to say is to, to shine a, a spotlight on the success stories and let people see the, the benefits to society and community and the jobs created and all of the positive outcomes that are generated um, when, you know, investments and tax funds are invested into basic research and all the way through to translation. Uh, and commercialisation. Andrew? Well, I, I guess I would say that, I mean, it already happens. I mean, BVF, which we've been talking about a couple of times this evening, is a great example. It's $2 billion over 10 years where the government is investing alongside other, other investors. So Victoria is doing it. Um, there's probably an opportunity for other, other governments around Australia to do it. it. It can be a bit fraught, though, and, and there's other big buckets of money which mm. can probably be more opened up for early innovation in, in terms of the superannuation sector and, and those sources of funding. I, we we co-invest alongside four super funds with the Brandon Capital Funds, but perhaps there's the opportunity to be two or three more Brandon Capital Funds. Great. And there's a few more questions, but I'm going to just have one last selecting for comments from the last four of you. The question is, regulatory compliance can be one of the biggest barriers to startups achieving translation. How can we help lower this barrier for Australian medtech med and I assume biotech startups? George? Um, yeah, this is a good one. So we have a regulated device um, and software where TGA approved, CE approved and now FDA approved. Um, we found navigating that landscape very difficult until we found individuals uh, that could assist us in undertaking that. It's very difficult to get that con get consulting to undertake that. It's expensive and it really doesn't allow you to shape your strategic pathway behind that. So how can it be, how can it be made easier? Better education, more people within the industry to allow um, early stage businesses to kind of get advice and help in how to navigate that in the early phases, I think. Yeah. I think I might let you have a go this time, Michelle. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, one of my roles at Monash University is running the Medicines Manufacturing Innovation Centre, um, something that was also supported by the Victorian State Government uh, and we've been up and running for five years. We work very closely with a lot of start-up companies and help them develop their <coughs> products um, and you know, explain the regulatory process and develop methodologies that are then ready to be tech transferred into GMP manufacturing companies. All of the staff within the MMIC, their sole focus and metrics are supporting industry. There's no incentive to, to publish or to be doing your own personal research. The entire research agenda is what industry comes to us with and asks us to do with a group of individuals who understand the drug development process and commercialisation process. But we do stop at that stage and then hand it over to whether it's a contract manufacturing organisation or they licence it into another company. Andrew, I'm going to let you have the last word on this. Um, <laughs> look, uh, look, the reg we shouldn't forget the regulations are there for a reason, and that's the safety of patients. So you don't want to necessarily make them easier to, you know, to jump over. You need to make them easier to navigate, I think, as someone said. And, and, and just to add to the skills piece, I mean, that's one of the reasons we're looking to um, establish something like an incubator. So, so small companies and the people in those companies can be co-located with larger companies and the people that have those skills and you can get a cross learning and, and um, you know, a benefit on both sides really. So it's about developing the skills to find a pathway through those, those regulations. Fantastic, thank you very much. Let me, on behalf of all of us, thank the four people on the, on, out on the stage. I'll let you, let you take a seat and only in two minutes' time you can get a well-earned drink.
So thank you. I know it's gone a little bit over time, but I think if you're like me, the insights that we just had from the four people, the two speakers, and from Nick, it was worth the extra time. Clearly from tonight, there was a couple of key points that have come out. Um, there is no right or wrong way. It was one of the questions we asked before about how to innovate. But there were five things that we picked up. Identify a problem. Be open-minded to solutions. Be very persistent. Tom was one of the most persistent men I know. Seek guidance from experts. You heard it again from the panel. And learning to clearly articulate a vision. Learn how to sell is what Tom pretty much told us. The examples of CSL, Synchron, SEER, Professor McIntosh, have shown us that successful technology development follows when innovators can combine with the right people with complementary skills and knowledge. And you heard from Andrew with the last comment, building incubators, getting people together, that seems to be the secret source. I also picked up from those discussions that it's not just the scientists on the stage or the professionals that work in these companies that make research translation happen. It's actually everyone in the audience who thinks they're not part of it, you actually are, whether it's by supporting it, whether it's by getting involved, using your commercial skills, or in many cases, perhaps investing your own money behind some of these ideas. I'd like to thank a huge thank you to our sponsor, our keynote sponsor, NAB Health, and our other sponsor, Neobionica and DBS Technologies. I'd especially like to thank Andrew, because I know there's a lot of work put into that presentation. He's a man who's got not a lot of time to do these things. And also, particularly for Tom, and through, through Tom to Nick, for making that time in Brooklyn. I understand that presentation was done at 10.30 one evening, unscripted, and done with about an hour's notice. So it wasn't bad. <laughs> I hope you found the whole night informative and stimulating. Uh, this is something we want to do every year. We think it's really important that people of the general community can interact to see what's going on with your taxpayer funding research and the great things that are happening in this country. We have recorded the event. I know there's a lot of people on the waiting list that couldn't have seen it, so we deliberately did that. It's going to be shared on our website. We'd be delighted if you could share it with your colleagues, friends and your networks to see some fantastic insights from some great Australian technologists. Lastly, but, but not to the end, it's been a wonderful night. Thank you for letting, me, letting us and me go a little bit over time. But till next year, thank you and please enjoy our hospitality. Thank you.